the soft security is quite a new discipline. <laughs> what are the biggest challenges of the soft security today? The biggest challenge is that most developers um, don't know about software security. Mm -hmm. So you have a lot of people who learn how to program, but no one teaches them about the security implications of using certain code patterns or certain languages or how to think about security while they're building stuff. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of people that are writing code today that don't know anything about security yet, and we have to reach those people. Mm -hmm. In my work, we've probably directly reached about a quarter million developers, but I think there are about eight million developers, so I think that we're 1 29th of the way there. Mm -hmm. The good news is that, you know, 10 years ago, when you were becoming a developer, there was nowhere to go to learn about software security. Now there are plenty of books and there are plenty of people talking about it, and the world has changed for the better. That's good. Yeah, yeah. that's good. So that's what your goal is for the future, then, to, meet, to meet those left over developers that have done time. Pretty much. Yeah. I mean, so the old paradigm in, in computer security used to be, let's protect the broken stuff from the bad people by putting a thing. And the thing was usually a firewall yeah. on the network. And in, you know, about 2000, the late 90s, I just came along and said, I got a simple question. Why is this stuff broken? <laughs> so if we can intentionally build stuff with security in mind, if we can do security mm -hmm. engineering, um, if we can put software security in practice, we'll just have an easier pile of stuff to secure. And it'll, the, our job will be possible. Simple. <laughs> Simple idea. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, um, we feel a lot of stuff to be a bit retrospective. Mm -hmm. um, what have been the most significant challenges uh, and achievements in software security in the latest years? Well, I think the, the most significant achievement is that we have a field now. Yeah. Um, and if you measure the field in terms of revenue, I think that computer security as a whole is growing at about 8.9% compound annual growth over mm -hmm. time. It's about a 35 to $40 billion industry um, on planet Earth, which is, you know, it's not little, but it's not big. Software security is about 10% of that. Mm -hmm. So maybe about two to $4 billion in revenue each year. However, it's growing at a compound annual growth rate of 20%. Mm -hmm. So now we're like the pinky finger of computer security, but we're growing twice as fast, so pretty soon we'll be this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the question is, how much of computer security can software security uh, take? Yeah. It's a new paradigm, the idea of building stuff right, but it's catching on, so that's kind of mm. cool. cool. Do you think the software security can put aside the, uh, all the discipline within security, replace it for the better? Yeah, I think, I think it can replace it for the better. I think that, by and large, people that build systems already have some processes. Mm. And so we don't want to replace those processes. We just want to enhance those mm -hmm. processes. So for example, if you're doing some code review as part of your software development lifecycle, what about using a code review tool that knows about security? Mm -hmm. Or what about thinking about security while you're doing code review? That's a perfect example. Mm -hmm. um, and there are a set of best practices that I call touch points in my own work that should be integrated into any software development lifecycle and that really is what software security is about from a technical perspective. We made a huge amount of progress in that. Mm. Mm, good. Um, was it something that looked really promising in software security? And we showed that later on turn, turned out to be not working as well. Oh, Maybe. that's a good question. <laughs> I, I think that um, one of the most interesting aspects of software security where we haven't made as much progress as we need to make is in the requirements level. So when you're coming up with the requirements for a system um, or you're doing say use cases or user stories in an agile situation, we need to enhance that with abuse cases or misuse cases. Mm. Um, interestingly, some of the earliest work in that stuff is done by Norwegians. <laughs> if, if you know Joran Breivik, he, he worked on that, that work. Of, that's why I know Norway so mm. well because of him. <laughs> but, but, uh, but we haven't pushed that work as far as we need it to go. You know, so we've made a lot more progress in code review. We've made some progress in architecture. But when you get back to requirements level, we still have work to do. And, and I thought we'd be further along than we are by now. Right. So what can we learn from those mistakes that we have done? 
Well, we can just learn that it, it's very hard to get people to have discipline about requirements. Um, and we already knew that from software development. When you say to a developer, hey, can you show me your requirements? They go, oh, yeah, <laughs> I think the business people wrote that down in a Word document somewhere. You know, and so the, so the issue of institutionalizing that sort of knowledge is the, is the real challenge. Hmm. Yeah. Um, you have a quite simple idea of the solution. You're just talking about build stuff right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Sounds easy, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, but, but why is it so challenging to actually implement and do? Because there are three things that make software security hard. Um, number one is everything's connected to the net. So being networked um, is a big challenge because you're opening yourself up to all possible attackers out there in the world. So that's, that's one. Mm -hmm. Number two is complexity. So we're building artifacts and software systems that are more complicated than anything ever built before on planet Earth. And complexity makes it hard for you to secure a system. It's easy for an attacker to find a mistake you've made in a very complicated system, but it's very hard for you to anticipate all possible attacks. So mm -hmm. complexity is the friend of the attacker. And the third thing is extensibility. So we built systems on purpose that we can extend on the fly in interesting ways. If you want to think about a trend that concerns me right now in software development, you need to look no further than Node.js and JavaScript mm -hmm. and the fact that everything's compiling to JavaScript these days. That's terrible <laughs> from a security perspective. We're not going to be able to stop it, but it's just a, you know, it's a terrible thing anyway. Mm -hmm. And so that's a trend that we're going to have to grapple with. So those three things together I call the trinity of trouble. Okay. That is, you know, being networked, being complicated, and being extensible. That's what makes software security so interesting, and that's why it's just non-trivial. <laughs> Um, if you talk about the BSIM, mm -hmm. um, can you tell us a little bit about it? So how did it start? And yeah, so one of the challenges in any aspect of computer security is that it's not much of a science. Mm -hmm. It's too much of, uh, you know, opinions about you should do this, you should do that. And there are many opinions about software security in particular. We're trying to turn the field from a set of opinions and expert-driven ideas towards science. Mm -hmm. And the way to do that is to measure stuff. So the BSIM is a measurement tool for measuring the software security activity inside of a firm. If you're familiar with Microsoft's yeah. Trustworthy Computing Initiative mm -hmm. and the SDL, well, the BSIM is a measurement tool for measuring how well the SDL is working inside of Microsoft. Um, mm -hmm. And we've used the BSIM to measure 67 different firms right mm -hmm. now. So we have a lot of data and we can measure a new firm, we can compare that to how the other 67 firms look. We've got 26 huge financial services organizations, 25 major software houses involved in this project. So we have a lot of data about how those firms are doing software security, and we can use that, that data for comparison and for you know drawing a baseline and for planning based on data mm -hmm. instead of just planning based on prevailing winds. Yeah. Yeah, or mm -hmm. budget. So this is something that the security experts can use to which the uh, board and the CEO. Exactly, so, so what this does is it gives you a way of measuring what you're doing as an organization and comparing yourself to your peers. Yeah. Um, and you can show it in, in really simple pictures, which is great for the board. <laughs> <laughs> then you need it to have the simple. Yeah, yeah simple, <laughs> simple pictures with two curves, you know, real, real easy stuff. Yeah. You show that to a CEO and the CEO goes, hey, uh, how come our curve is not as good as that curve? And you say, we could make it as good. Okay, do it. <laughs> um, when we're talking about education, uh, how should we teach the tech students um, who in the future work at development? Right. Who do not have a specific uh, information security responsibility. Yeah. How should we teach them? That's a real challenge. Mm. So I, I think that um, I have a philosophy degree. Mm. You know, okay. my first degree was in philosophy, and I like that because it taught me how to read and think and write and communicate. I think that the first thing you should concentrate on as a student, even if you're in engineering, mm. is how to do that. <laughs> think, read, write, communicate, mm. right? And, um, and then get some base knowledge to build on. Then you'd go to the master's level, you start mastering particular technical approaches um, and aspects of a domain like software security. That's a good place to really become a specialist in, in some aspect of, of technology. 
uh, PhD should be um, doing novel research and figuring out how to push the scientific limits of what you're doing. So for example, thinking about how to deal with this dynamic language problem that we're creating ourselves with Node.js. Mm -hmm. And JavaScript would be a great thing for a PhD to look into. You can't do static analysis on a dynamic system where the code hasn't arrived yet. <laughs> so what can you do? Um, that's a research question that somebody should write a PhD on. <laughs> So, so you can see the difference is um, specialization and the depth of knowledge as you kind of move up the curriculum. Yeah. I think, well, when it comes to tech students, I think they aren't that common to take the uh, art bachelor. Right. And then go up to the master. Yeah, tech. that's too bad. <laughs> <laughs> that's why people think engineers are boring with their little pocket protectors and stuff, you know, can't speak to other human beings. and. And mm -hmm. I, I think we need to do as much as we can in technology education and I even inside of engineering schools to realize that to make engineering have a real impact on society, mm -hmm. we have to be well-rounded people. We have to understand art. We have to understand how designers think. We have to understand how what motivates business people. And if we just geek out um, and don't think about those things, we'll just be pets <laughs> of these people. But we don't want to be pets, we want to be peers. Mm. And that's a big difference. Mm. Um, well, how should we reach out to those people who develop software without them having received any form of training? Yeah, the yeah. they, they, they asked me that upstairs. Yeah. I, I don't have a good answer yeah. for that one. So, so uh, you know, in the domains that, that, that I'm working in now, the people I come across are mostly people who understand software security or they understand the implications for their business or they know why it's important. As far as, you know, the person who watches television or the person on the street, I, I'm not sure how to get to those people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I do know that when you're a geek and you go out to a cocktail party and somebody says, oh, you're a, you're a software guy. Can you help me make my Microsoft operating system? And you're just like, oh, God, no, no. It's kind of like asking a lawyer for some legal advice at a cocktail party. It drives you crazy. Well, I do that. But they don't do that. You need to stop doing that. Okay. <laughs> um, when it comes to the complex and big software, um, you're talking about complex code also gives more bugs. Yes. Um, how can we ensure that in, to incorporate security and also get rid of all this bug if possible uh, in software that is so complex that we almost don't understand? Ourselves? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, the, the answer is twofold. So mm -hmm. it's actually quite easy to do static analysis on certain programming languages. Mm -hmm. And because programming languages usually compile or get interpreted in a formal way, we can build programs to look at those programs and find bugs. Mm -hmm. What we can't do is build a program to look at those programs at an architecture level and find flaws, architectural flaws. So that's the challenge. I think we're, 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 we're making very good progress in bugs, yeah. but we're not making as very good progress yet in flaws. If you think about computer security over time, mm -hmm. over decades, it looks like this. In the beginning, it was about configuration. You know, making sure you had the right software release, making sure your firewall rules were configured right, your network was architected right. That's all configuration stuff. Then we moved to the age of bugs. We're in the age of bugs right now, where we, we realize that, ooh, it's the systems that we built that are the problem. There are vulnerabilities inside of those, and we can find and eradicate bugs. As we move from the age of bugs, we're entering the age of flaws, that is, architecture stuff. How do we find architectural problems? How do we fix architectural problems? How do we architect stuff properly in the first place? Mm -hmm. And guess what? There's another one coming. In 10 years, we'll be talking about trust enclaves. Mm -hmm. So that is the evolution of computer security over the last few decades mm -hmm. and where we're going to go. We talk about bugs and flaws. Well, what are the difference between those two? The difference is a bug is a defect in the implementation mm. that's usually syntactic in nature, and a flaw is a defect in the design or architecture. Mm. Okay. And so, you know, automating the finding of defects in the code is quite easy, bugs. Automating the finding of flaws, much more difficult because no one's really sure what a software architect is anyway. I mean, you can't. There are software architecture classes, but when you take them, you don't become a software architect. 
Um, that's still a black art, so we've got a ways to go when it comes to architecture. Mm. Um, one of the key points that I'm going to talk about today is that the politicians and government are focusing too much on offense. Oh, yeah. Rather than defense. Oh, themselves. yeah. Yep, yep. Um, how can we turn that focus? Gosh, to it's more defending one. So that's what I'm giving my talk on today. Mm. It's a cyber war talk, and actually, it should be called a cyber peace talk. <laughs> um, the problem is that we've put in charge of cyber defense mm -hmm. our war fighters, especially in the United States. Um, so we have a bunch of admirals and generals and spooks that are in charge of thinking about cybersecurity, and they want to build weapons, and they have built a bunch of weapons. And they're, I liken it to this, it's like piling up rocks, um, but we all live in a glass house, mm -hmm. and you know your grandmother said, don't throw rocks mm -hmm. in a glass house. <laughs> and we're working on fast, accurate rock throwing. Mm -hmm. So that's an, an issue. We need to work on making sure our house is not so glassy um, before we all start throwing rocks. Mm -hmm. and, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on that. If you think about it, if you have um, the NSA mm -hmm. in charge of cyber defense, and they're also in charge of espionage, you're asking them to do two things that don't cohere. I have no problem with spies. I'm glad that my spies are really good. In fact, they're probably among the best, and their technical um, capabilities are fantastic. But they shouldn't be put in charge of defending stuff because they're exploiting the problems in our systems to do spying so effectively. If you carry around your cell phone and it's a fantastic espionage device, then you ask them to make that secure, they're going to be like, that's what I use to do my spying job. You know, which one do you want me to do? That means from a policy perspective, we need to have someone else overseeing cyber defense and cyber offense and espionage. They need to be separate organizations. And I don't think that in the United States we've grappled with that properly from a policy perspective. That's what the talk is going to be about today. Um, you talked about the government falling behind when it comes to security. Software security. Software security. Yep, Sorry. Yep. Um, how should we work to lift them up to more up-to-date I don't situation? know. I mean, the government is, do you ever think of the government as leading edge in anything? They're no. always <laughs> lagging, right, from technology perspective. The problem is that technology is moving so fast these days that even a two-year lag seems like infinity. You know, so I'm wearing Google Glass. When do you think the President of the United States is going to be wearing Google Glass? <laughs> <laughs> no idea. Or some, you know, it's even worse in the States. We have some people in Congress that don't even believe in evolution. I mean, these people are idiots. <laughs> and, and, and that's a problem. Um, but that's the way it goes in a democracy, right? Mm. So you have to bring everyone along. And we can't expect them to always lead technically. We have to lead technically. Mm. And it's our duty to explain why we need to do things a certain way and be careful when we build systems and think about things like software security. Mm. And then it comes in that we have to be able to communicate this Ex rather than exactly. it. Exactly, exactly. Mm. It's all a big circle. Yeah. <laughs> Second line. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well I'm going to say thank you for the interview and the questioning. You're welcome. And we're going to prepare ourselves for the presentation now. Yeah, great. Mm. Pleasure sure. to be here. <laughs>